and welcome to our video lecture on topic D1.2, protein synthesis. Our guiding questions for today, how does a cell produce a sequence of amino acids from a sequence of DNA bases? And how is the reliability of protein synthesis ensured? Our objectives, we're going to define gene expression, transcription, and translation. We're going to talk about the functions of RNA polymerase and transcription and of ribosomes in translation. We're going to talk about the structure of ribosomes and of transfer RNA molecules, as well as state the function of tRNA activating enzymes. We'll discuss the importance of hydrogen bonding to so many pieces of, D of protein synthesis. We'll compare and contrast replication and transcription, as well as transcription and translation. We'll practice using a codon chart. We'll explain the universality and degeneracy of the genetic code, and we'll wrap up with a little look at mutations. Gene expression is exactly that. It is the expression of specific genes, and it's done through two processes, transcription and translation. Transcription is using the DNA code to produce a sequence of messenger RNA nucleotides. We call that the transcript. And then in translation, we take that messenger RNA transcript and we use it to put together a sequence of amino acids that is a polypeptide chain that can get folded into a functional protein. A couple extra little vocab words to think about. The genome of a cell or an organism is the entirety of all of its genes. The transcri ooh, if I could spell, transcriptome of a cell, a tissue, an organism is all of the messenger RNA transcripts that it makes. And then the proteome is the collection of all of the proteins of a cell or a tissue or a system, whatever it is that we are looking at. Transcription, again, is that synthesis of a messenger RNA transcript using a DNA template. Here we have our DNA. Notice that we only have one template strand, and then we have the other as a non-template strand. This is different from DNA replication, in which we were copying both of the strands of DNA to make more, more DNA. Also different from DNA replication, we just have this one single enzyme complex, RNA polymerase, which does pretty much all the work of transcription. Way different from DNA replication, in which we had, oh my gosh, so many enzymes. We talked about helicase and topoisomerase. We talked about primase and DNA polymerase 3, and also DNA polymerase 1, and ligase. And here we just have RNA polymerase, so that's kind of nice. RNA polymerase is going to bind to a part of the DNA called the promoter region. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a couple slides. It will open up the DNA. It'll break those hydrogen bonds between the complementary base pairs. No helicase required. The polymerase, RNA polymerase, will move along the template strand of the DNA. It will slide into place the complementary bases to the template DNA. It will glue those RNA ribonucleotides into this chain of messenger RNA using some phosphodiester bonds, just like in replication. When it gets to a terminator sequence, term, oh my gosh, terminator um, sequence, then the RNA polymerase will let go of the DNA strand, and voila, we have our piece of messenger RNA. And just like in DNA replication, hydrogen bonding is incredibly important. Here, hydrogen bonding allows us to put together complementary base pairs, just like in DNA synthesis. However, this time we're going to code together one DNA and one RNA base. Guanine and cytosine will still pair with each other. We've got those hydrogen bonds between our guanine and cytosine. Notice that there are one, two, three, one, two, three. Even though this is a ribonucleotide and this is a deoxyribonucleotide, here, notice that my adenine is going to code with uracil instead of with thymine. Thymine in the DNA will still code to adenine in the RNA, but uh, we don't have any thymine in the RNA. So instead, adenine will code with uracil. Just like in our DNA, we have purines and pyrimidines. Our purines are still guanine and adenine. Remember, um, two puga. Y cut one, our crazy mnemonic device to remember that guanine and adenine are purines, and then 
pyrimidines include cytosine, uracil, and thymine. Uracil, uracil here is a pyrimidine, only that one ring, as opposed to adenine and guanine that have two. So lots of hydrogen bonding between complementary base pairs, but now with RNA, we have uracil instead of thymine. Now, before we move on to translation, I do want us to take a moment to be really specific and deliberate about comparing and contrasting DNA replication and transcription. It's very easy to kind of mash these guys up together in our brains because they do have a lot of details that are similar and so therefore super easy to confuse. Both are enzyme controlled and that makes these both processes involved in metabolism. Of course, in DNA replication, we've got so many enzymes, helicase primase, DNA polymerase 3, and 1, and ligase, whereas in transcription, we have that one big, beautiful enzyme complex, RNA polymerase. Both are anabolic and involve condensation reactions. We have the formation of polymers through polymerization reactions, and then phosphodiester bonds hold together the monomers of those polymers. However, the polymer in transcription is messenger RNA, whereas the polymer in DNA replication is, of course, DNA. Despite the different products, both of them start with a DNA template. DNA is used to code for DNA, and then DNA is used to code for messenger RNA. Both of them depend on hydrogen bonding between complementary base pairs to make sure that we have the correct sequence of nucleotides in the growing strands. Those base pairs are just a little bit different. In DNA replication, we've got adenine and thymine, and then cytosine and guanine as our pairs. In transcription, we have adenine pairing with uracil, but then still our cytosine and guanine. A few more differences in DNA replication, both strands of the DNA are template strands, whereas in transcription, only one of those DNA strands is actually the template. In transcription, no primer is required, whereas, we, whereas in DNA replication, we definitely need that RNA primer to get things going. In DNA replication, we copy the whole entire genome whereas in transcription, only one gene is copied or used to make messenger RNA. In DNA replication, DNA polymerase 3 acts as its own proofreader. There is not this function in transcription. And one last little difference in transcription, we do have this super cool process called splicing in which we modify the pre-messenger RNA, the primary messenger RNA, just in eukaryotes, there is no splicing in DNA replication. And moving on to translation now. This is where we use our messenger RNA transcript to code for a sequence of amino acids that builds a polypeptide chain. That polypeptide chain can then get folded into functional proteins. This all happens in the cytoplasm where we have lots and lots of ribosomes. Our messenger RNA here will bind to the ribosome. We have a start codon. We'll talk about codons a little bit more in a couple slides and a stop codon. And these parts of the messenger RNA, these special codes within the messenger RNA, just let the ribosome know where to start and where to stop. This helps us to regulate exactly what amino acid chain we are building. Sometimes we can use our messenger RNA transcripts multiple times. Sometimes we might have some enzymes come in and break it down right away after only one use. We also have these super cool molecules called transfer RNA, tRNA molecules that bring in these amino acids. We have different transfer RNAs for each amino acid. The transfer RNAs have a special code on them known as the anticodon. That anticodon is complementary to the codons on the messenger RNA. These anticodon codon pairings depend just like in replication and transcription on hydrogen bonding between complementary base pairs. We'll talk about that a little bit more on the next couple slides. 
Ribosomes are pretty cool. They come in two subunits. We have a small subunit. This has the messenger RNA binding site. And then we have large subunits, and these are where we have our transfer RNA binding sites. Ribosomes are composed of some ribosomal RNA and some proteins. And these guys are pretty cool because even though they're not exactly protein enzymes, they are definitely metabolic in nature. We're also going to take a look at the structure of transfer RNA or tRNA molecules here. These guys are composed of only RNA, no protein like our ribosomes have. But what's crazy cool about them is they have just a single strand of RNA. However, they will hydrogen bond to their own base pairs. So this single strand of transfer RNA will hydrogen bond to itself complementary base pairing within one strand of transfer RNA, as opposed to in DNA where we have those two strands that will bind to each other. Pretty cool, right? So cool. We get these lovely little hairpin turns in the, in the shape of the molecule, and that allows it to do its job sliding into those binding sites on the large subunit of the ribosome, carrying the amino acids on their three prime end, having that anti-codon that is complementary to the codon code of the messenger RNA. Usually we simplify the structure of transfer RNA, make it look a little bit like a T-shape almost, um, but in reality the three-dimensional folding is a little bit more like this shape. Different transfer RNA molecules with different anticodons carry different amino acids. And so it's super important that we bind the correct amino acid to the correct transfer RNA. We have lots of enzymes known as transfer RNA activating enzymes that make this happen. We can also sometimes call them a slightly fancier name, amino acyl tRNA synthetase. In the taste. Um, I prefer tRNA activating enzyme because it helps me remember what its job is. So these guys, again, super shape dependent. So the shape of each transfer RNA activating enzyme will bind to the shape of a specific amino acid and the shape of a specific transfer RNA molecule. We use some ATP and that phosphorylation to give energy to the enzyme so that it can bind together exactly the right amino acid with exactly the right transfer RNA. And then we have what we call a charged transfer RNA ready to carry that amino acid to the ribosome. And when that transfer RNA gets to the ribosome, all kinds of magic happens. Here we have the small subunit of the ribosome bound to the messenger RNA strand. Here's the large subunit of the ribosome with its transfer RNA binding sites. The first transfer RNA is going to start here in the P site. A second amino acid bound transfer RNA is going to slide into the next spot, the A site, on again that large subunit of the ribosome. All of this depends on complementary base pairing. We've got the anticodon here on the transfer RNA, the codon here of the messenger RNA, another anticodon complementary to this next codon. The ribosome is going to catalyze the formation of a peptide bond. We're talking about amino acids getting glued together here, so it's a peptide bond between this amino acid on the P site tRNA and this amino acid on the A site tRNA. So basically the ribosome chops off all the amino acids on the P tRNA and plops them onto the end of the amino acid on the A site. We end up with something that looks like this. So this transfer RNA is now empty, it's uncharged, it's going to go back to a tRNA activating enzyme and pick up another amino acid and do this all over again. And here I have this transfer RNA on the A site that now has all of the amino acids. So all of these guys that were here are now stuck on just the A site transfer RNA. 
what happens now is a little bit of a shimmy. The guy in the P site is going to slide over to the E site and E's for exit. It's going to exit. The guy in the A site is going to slide over to the P site. The guy that used to be here is now slid to the P site. And then it happens all over again. We now have this guy in the P site. Another guy will come into the A site. And by guy, I mean transfer RNA with a bound amino acid. The ribosome will catalyze the formation of a peptide bond between the amino acids on the P site, transfer RNA into the A site, tRNA. And now the guy, the transfer RNA in the P site will slide over to the E site, E for exit. The A tRNA will slide to the P site and then the whole thing happens all over again until we get to the stop codon. Translation and transcription, just like transcription and DNA replication, have a lot in common. And so it's worth our while to pause here for a moment, compare and contrast these two processes, make sure we are keeping them distinct in our brains. Both are metabolism. However, transcription is carried out by RNA polymerase, whereas in translation, ribosomes are catalyzing the formation of the chemical bonds. In translation, we are forming polymers that are polypeptide chains. The monomers are amino acids, and those amino acids are held together by peptide bonds. And again, ribosomes are catalyzing the formation of those peptide bonds between the amino acids. In transcription, our polymer is messenger RNA, that messenger RNA transcript, which is composed of RNA nucleotides. Those nucleotides are bound together by phosphodiester bonds. RNA polymerase catalyzes the formation of those bonds. Both involve messenger RNA. In transcription, messenger RNA is the product of the process, whereas in translation, messenger RNA is the template of the process. Both involve hydrogen bonding between complementary bases. In transcription, those complementary bases are actually one DNA to one RNA base. Where in translation, we have messenger RNA bases complementary to transfer RNA bases. We call triplets of messenger RNA bases codons complementary to those triplets of transfer RNA bases anticodons. Transcription has no codons, no anticodons. And translation requires the use of transfer RNA molecules, and of course, those transfer RNA activating enzymes whereas transcription has no need for transfer RNA. I have used this term codon quite a few times already today. We're gonna to pause and talk about what even is a codon. Codons are triplets, three sums of messenger RNA nucleotides that code for a specific amino acid. We are going to practice using this amazing codon chart here to take this DNA gene sequence convert it through transcription into a messenger RNA transcript, and then we will translate that messenger RNA transcript into our sequence of amino acids that builds our polypeptide chain. So our DNA starts off with A, ooh, T, A, C. I got ahead of myself there. T, A, C. So we're going to use some complementary base pairing. T is going to code with A in my messenger RNA. A codes to U, remember there's no thymine in messenger RNA, and then C to G. I'm going to pause here because remember that codons are triplets, triplets of messenger RNA. I'm going to use my codon chart, this amazing codon chart, to figure out what amino acid will be coded for by AUG. My first nucleotide, my first guy, is the A, adenine, and then I have uracil, so my second guy is uracil, and then last I've got guanine, so in my third position I've got guanine. I'm going to find where the three of these guys kind of intersect, and we end up with methionine. AUG, this codon AUG, codes for the amino acid methionine, or MET. The next triplet, TCG, in my DNA is going to be AGC in my messenger RNA. So I'm going to go A and then G, AGC, AGC here codes for serine. So my next amino acid is going to be serine. Next up, I've got GCT. It's going to be C, G, A. I'm going to go ahead and finish. A, G, G. Remember that A codes to U, T to A, C to G. And then finally, 
C A D U C to G. C G A C G A C G A is arginine A R G A G G A G G A G G is ooh interesting also arginine U A G U A G U A G is ooh stop literally that means stop even though I have one more code on here I am not going to translate it because my ribosome would quite literally stop at this stop codon this is going to be my polypeptide sequence that I can get from my messenger RNA what's pretty cool about this codon chart is that it is what we call universal and so this chart is what humans use it's pretty much the same as what yeast use and what bacteria use there are a few exceptions there are some differences amongst organisms but most of us most living things use exactly the same universal codon chart which provides evidence for a common ancestor for all of us there are some differences which provides evidence for evolution things do change a little bit over time another super cool thing about our codon chart remember how we had those two arginines despite having two different codons this is what we call the degeneracy of the codon chart we have multiple codons that can code for the same amino acid which makes sense because if i have four potential different bases in three different spots in my codons fundamental counting principle says there are about 64 different sequences of nucleotides in my codons but i only have about 20 amino acids so there must be some codons that are doubles that are duplicates and this is the degeneracy of the codon chart this is good because it means that i can have some differences in my dna but not have an impact on my protein that gets coded at the end of translation here's another example of a codon chart that i want us to know how to use these cards i think are way more fun um so dna to messenger rna i did this already that transcription piece we're just going to do the translation part messenger rna to polypeptide this is the same sequence that we had on the previous slide so don't panic too much about practicing again um, but how to use this codon chart so if my codon is a u g i'm going to start here in the middle with my a and then a slide out to my u and then end up at g so a u g is once again methionine methionine is pretty cool we know it as the start codon methionine is our start codon proteins usually start with methionine a g c is next i'm going to go a and then slide out to g and then slide out to c and there's my serine and then i've got cga c to g to a there's my arginine and again a to g to g there's the other arginine and then u to a to g that lock tells me that it's my stop codon and so again we'll stop so codon charts sometimes i'll let you pick which one you want to use but be prepared to know how to use both of these on exams remember that the degeneracy or redundancy repetitiveness of our codon chart allows us to have some changes in dna sequence that do not have an impact on protein structure that's not always true some of our mutations mutations are changes in the dna sequence of a gene some of these mutations can actually lead to significant changes in protein shape and therefore protein structure we're going to look at one specific example here the mutation that leads to sickle cell anemia this dna sequence is a tiny little piece of the gene that codes for the protein hemoglobin hemoglobin is on our red blood cells and it helps us carry oxygen around our bodies so that we can carry out aerobic respiration make lots of atp there is a mutation that can flip this T to an A and this A to a T. We should have GAG as our messenger RNA codon from CTC, and that leads to the amino acid, glutamic acid, in this position in the hemoglobin protein. This is normal, and hemoglobin can do its job perfectly normally. However, if that T flips to an A, then my codon is now g u g instead of g a g 
and this is going to result in valine as the amino acid in this position of the hemoglobin protein. This mutation causes the shape of hemoglobin, especially in environments of low oxygen, to morph the shape of our red blood cells into these sickle shapes instead of these frisbee shapes. These sickled red blood cells will clot in very small capillaries, the very small blood vessels of our bodies, and lead to lots of tissue damage and incredible pain. This kind of point mutation, point because it's a single point in the DNA code, has a huge impact on protein structure and function. And with that, my friends, we have arrived at the end of our video lecture on protein synthesis. We talked about gene expression, transcription, translation. We talked about the functions of RNA polymerase and transcription and of ribosomes in translation. We talked about the structure of ribosomes. We talked about the structure of transfer RNA molecules and the function of tRNA activating enzymes. We talked about hydrogen bonding and protein synthesis between DNA and messenger RNA, and then also between messenger RNA and transfer RNA. We made so many Venn diagrams comparing and contrasting replication and transcription, as well as transcription and translation. We used those couple different kinds of codon charts. We talked about the universality of the codon chart. Lots of organisms use almost exactly the same codon chart. Degeneracy, we have some repetitiveness to that codon chart, which helps us to be protected from some mutations, but sadly not all. There are some mutations that do lead to protein structure and therefore protein function changes. Well done today, my friends.